discussing about the topic laser which is very important as full form of this topic uh, laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation now why this topic is important the importance of laser is due to its unique properties it differentiate ordinary light source and laser from each other by some properties directionality second property which differentiate laser is intensity third is monochromaticity and fourth is coherency so these are the four properties which are unique and these are associated with laser or we can compare laser and ordinary light source by these properties so first is directionality light emitted by laser is in one direction only single direction only but due to ordinary source light is emitted in all possible direction intensity due to laser is very very high and the reason is all the photons which are emitted by laser they are concentrated in a very small wave in a very small region but due to ordinary source intensity is scattered distributed in area so intensity is basically number of photons colliding per unit area which is very very high for laser and it is distributed so very low for ordinary light source light emitted by laser is more monochromatic than ordinary light source like if we are taking example of sodium vapor lamp which is an ordinary monochromatic source that gives you two sodium lines of wavelength 5890 and 5896 angstrom but for laser like for example helium neon laser the wavelength we are getting is single wavelength that is 6328 angstrom so laser is more monochromatic than ordinary light source and the light emitted by laser is perfectly coherent as compared to the light emitted by ordinary light source as in case of laser light is emitted in single direction so the photons which are moving in one direction all of them are in same phase with each other crust and trough coincides with each other crust of one coincide with crust of other trough of one coincides with trough of other so light emitted by laser is perfectly coherent but if we are considering dealing with ordinary light then light emitted by ordinary light source is emitted in all possible direction so if two photons which are moving in opposite direction their phase can't be correlated with each other so ordinary light gives you perfectly incoherent source so these are the unique properties that differentiate laser than ordinary light source <clears throat> now why to study laser because nowadays everywhere we are using laser light everywhere this laser can be used some important applications or this laser is used in barcode reading in compact disc to read out the data stored in cd or dvd the light used is laser light then in medical field in communication everywhere this laser is used so this laser is very important now here in this lecture we will discuss about some basic processes which are involved in the production of laser light so first process which is very important and that is absorption first process is absorption so let us consider a simple example we are having a two energy level system e1 and e2 where e1 is ground energy level e2 is excited energy level <clears throat> 
So, if electron is in ground energy level, then a photon must be incident of energy equals to E2 minus E1 on this ground level electron so that this photon will absorb that energy and excites to higher energy state by absorbing that photon. So, this process is called as absorption of radiation. Okay. Energy of photon must be energy difference between the two energy level where transition need to take place. So, if we want to bring this electron to second energy state, excited energy level E2, then uh, energy or photon must be of energy equals to E2 minus E1. So, by absorbing this incident energy, electron excites to higher energy state. This process is called as absorption of radiation. Now, whenever it will rest there for very short time period and that time period is called as lifetime of excited state. And that ranges normally from 10 to the power minus 7 to 10 to the power minus 8 seconds. Means what? Whenever electron comes in excited state, that state will not be a permanent state for that electron. It will stay there for this much time period only, 10 to the power minus 7 to minus 8 seconds. And after this lifetime, it will try to occupy its original level or it will try to reach its original level. So, second process which is involved in laser is spontaneous emission. So, this diagram gives you idea about before absorption and this is after absorption. So, before absorption, absorption electron is in ground state. So, due to incidence of a photon, electron goes in excited state. So, this is the after absorption process. Now, let us assume again the same example with two energy level system where E1 is ground energy level, E2 is excited state. And let us assume a photon is incident on ground level electron and by absorbing that electron, electron comes here in excited state. So, before spontaneous emission, electron is in excited state. So, as already we have discussed, lifetime of excited state is 10 to the power minus 7 to minus 8 seconds. So, whenever electron comes in excited state, it will rest there for this much time and after that the electron will de-excite to ground energy level and while coming it, it will emit a photon of energy E2 minus E1. So, while de-exciting, electron will emit a photon or radiation of energy equals to E2 minus E1. And from this, you can find wavelength associated with the photon by using relation E equals to HC by lambda, where H is Planck's constant, C is speed of light, and lambda is incident wavelength. So, if energy is known to us, H and C is constant, lambda can be calculated. Or from this, frequency can be calculated, H nu, where H is Planck's constant. So, if E is known to us, nu can be calculated. So, in this way, this electron after its lifetime in excited state de-excite to ground level spontaneously itself to ground state by emitting a radiation. So, this type of emission is called as spontaneous emission and this type of emission normally we are getting in ordinary light sources. <coughs> this emission is incoherent emission, incoherent light will be emitted in spontaneous emission. Now, here to produce laser light the emission required is a stimulated emission. So, let us see what is this stimulated emission. Okay. So, third process which is involved 
in the production of laser is stimulated emission. Now, <coughs> again consider a two energy level system where E1 is ground level, E2 is excited state and let us assume electron is excited in higher energy state. <coughs> So, as already we have discussed, whenever electron comes in excited state, it will rest there for very short time period and that is lifetime of electron in excited state 10 to the power minus 7 to minus 8 second. So, if before this lifetime, I incident another photon of energy, let us say E2 minus E1, then this excited electron will absorb that photon and de-excite to ground level. And while coming or de-exciting to ground level, it will emit two photons, both of energy equals to E2 minus E1. So, when electron comes in E2 energy state, it is having a photon because due to incidence of photon only, electron excites to higher energy state. So, in absorption process, the electron have already one photon extra. One more photon we have incident before 10 to the power minus 7 to minus 8 second. So, this also is absorbed by the electron. So, it is having extra photon. So, while coming from E2 to E1, it will emit two photons which are in same phase with each other or they gives you coherent source. Both have energy equals to E2 minus E1 and for both of them, wavelength can be calculated by relation E equals to HC by lambda where here again H is Planck's constant, C is speed of light and lambda is wavelength. So, if E is known to us, lambda can be calculated. <coughs> now, this is the forced emission or induced emission or this also can be called as stimulated emission. We are forcing this electron to shift to its original level, to shift to its ground energy level and that is why incidenting another photon. So, this will de-excite by emitting two radiations, two photons. So, this type of emission is called as forced or stimulated emission and this we are getting in laser light. So, you can see the difference between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission. In spontaneous, we are getting emission of one photon only. In stimulated emission, photons are doubled, multiplied. So, here whatever property just we have discussed few minutes before that is light is emitted in single direction only, intensity is very high for laser, so intensity is doubled here. Instead of single photon, we are getting two photons, then this laser gives you more monochromatic source as both the photons emitted are belonging to transition E2 to E1, so both have energy E2 minus E1. So, if energy is same, H and C is constant, lambda will be same, means for both of these photons wavelength will be same means the source we are getting is more monochromatic and as the photons are emitted at the same moment and they are moving in one direction, so they give you perfectly coherent source. So, all the four properties which we have discussed that can be satisfied with the stimulated emission. <coughs> now, next term which is very important again in case of laser light and that is population inversion. Now, here it is very simple to say that just by incidenting another pho photon before its lifetime, this transition E2 to E1 gives you stimulated emission. But at equilibrium or at room temp temperature normally most of the electron will try to stay, try to rest in its ground energy level as compared to its excited level. So, 
if this is the situation and if I incident a photon E2 minus E1 on the system, then any of these electron will absorb that energy and it will go to higher energy level that is E2. Now if again I want to produce stimulated emission of this electron, then what I need to do is I have to incident one more photon of energy E2 minus E1. Second photon I need to incident here. So if I incident one more photon, there may be possibility that this photon will be absorbed by electron which is present in ground state because majority of the electrons are in ground state, only one electron is in excited state. So probability of absorption is more as compared to stimulated emission. So what we need to do is we have to bring more number of electrons in excited state to increase the probability of stimulated emission. If I create a situation where maximum number of electrons are in excited state with respect to its lower state, then this photon which is incident may be absorbed by the electron which is in excited state or E2 state and it can cause stimulated emission of two photons. So this is required to produce stimulated emission and this condition is called as population inversion. We have inverted this population. We brought more number of electrons in excited state with respect to its lower state. So this population inversion meaning is when number of electrons, let us say, N2 in excited state and number of electrons N1 in ground state. So when N2 is very, very greater than N1, then the condition is called as population inversion condition. Means when number of electrons in excited state are very, very greater in number as compared to its lower energy level, then the condition is called as population inversion condition. And this is the most important condition required to produce stimulated emission. Without population inversion, stimulated emission cannot be produced. And that is the reason why this population inversion term is also called as principle of laser. Without this principle of laser or population inversion condition, laser light or stimulated emission cannot be produced. Few more things are very important required in the production of laser light that we will discuss after this.